first and foremost, thanks for coming. Number one thing I want to say is please, if you can, the link is in the, should be in the chat. Please, if you can, donate to the Village Arts Factory. Uh, what they're doing is unbelievable. And look, I work in television. I do so much with the arts. And what the, what the partnership has done in, in this location is unlike any other place I've seen. And I've done a lot in the arts around Metro Detroit, around the state. And all the help that they can get would be greatly, greatly appreciated. And I'll keep plugging that away because obviously nonprofit for the arts, arts and culture is so important, especially in times like this. Um, so please, if you can donate, that would be great. And yes, and Kelly, VA, the VFA is wonderful. And another really interesting thing for everybody is not only is it going to be a space for artists like myself and Kelly amongst the many others that are so talented, but they have a veterans home to help homeless veterans get on their feet, which, I mean, come on, it doesn't get any better than that. So if you can reach out and help, that'd be great. Oh yeah, it's come so far. Hunky Dory, you, ha you have no idea. You need to come. And I'm so mad that Google has not updated the street mats because they need to. It's unbelievable. So let's get into nature photography. I wanted, when they reached out to do classes, I wanted to talk to everybody about photography and nature photography because I think that just like with like oil paintings and clay work and um, everything in between, because there's so much art, photography has had such an impact on culture and people and history, really. I mean, you'll look at all the, you know, the famous photos you've ever seen and the lasting impact that one frame can have. You know, when, when and I'm going to get off sidetrack so many times, when I tell young cinematographers coming out into video, I tell them all the time, the first thing you should do is get a camera and you should learn how to tell a story with one frame. Compose, light, and if you can tell a story with one single frame, imagine what you can do with millions and billions of frames of a video camera. So, yeah, that's so I wanted to reach out, I, you know, being one of the two photographers in the building, I wanted to make sure our craft is getting out there a little bit. And I know everybody loves taking photos. I mean, everybody has a camera, whether or not it's their phone or a point and shoot or, you know, even bigger, right? Even more expensive. And... I don't want to go too in depth on on some of the real real specifics unless there's questions. But I'm going to pull up here my screen. Did it come through? I got to move chat a little bit. It did. Yay, and there's my me at the bottom. I'm sorry about the link up top. It's a little hard to see, but please again donate link in chat. Okay, so nature photography, this is very key. It's 703 I might wait a couple more minutes to start this. But in the meantime, while we wait, let's look at... I am not signed in. Retry, retry, re-sign back in. We're doing it live, everybody. We're going to do this live. Let's go to Google. Let's go to... Oh, that's right, because I am signed out here. Sign in. Okay, let's go to Google Drive. I have a bunch of photos on here I wanted to show everybody. We'll start here first and let some people come in and then we'll start breaking down some stuff. So I'm gonna go into some shots we took in Costa Rica, my wife and I. We went on our honeymoon, on honeymoon, our anniversary, 15th wedding anniversary. And I can tell you guys, if you love travel and you love photography, there's no better place than Costa Rica. No, but, and, and honestly, it's not even that expensive to go. Um, I don't know what this folder was. Edit. Oh, so this is a really good one. I have this one up behind me. I don't know if you guys can see it. Let's see. Can you see it? 
shoot one. Yeah, it's right. Woo, woo, it's right there. Anyways, um, so Costa Rica. So one thing I try to do when I'm taking photos and looking for photos in nature is kind of telling a story. And that's within that, that paper I shared online today. Part of my advice is that's one of the easiest way to get started and trying to find your composition, right? You know, it's easy just to say, oh, just go compose something. And some people can naturally compose something without any effort. My advice would be, instead of just pointing and trying to shoot and maybe getting frustrated, try to tell a story within that frame. And again, it could just be, even if it's a sunrise, like, you know, bring the camera low and I'll show you some op some examples of that. Bring the camera low to the water, you know, maybe eye level, maybe incorporate something in the foreground like rocks, right, to really show um, the scene and kind of, you know, put some texture to it. And yes, you should go to Costa Rica because it is amazing. Anyway, so this shot, honestly, this is one of the easiest shots I've ever done in my life. Um, if you look at, where am I at here? Okay, so if you look at this, I'm getting thrown off because the stream is a little delayed from what I'm seeing. I apologize. So this is just a simple uh, palm forest in Costa Rica. And what got me was how crazy specific they were and how detailed they were when they planted these palm trees. Now, the palm trees were originally planted, from what I was told, by a local for palm oil. But I don't know how much they're using them it now, but these forests just span the whole side of the highways. It's pretty amazing. So anyways, the, like you have these like alleyways, like, as you can see in this picture. And so basically, I wanted to, I did a couple different versions of this, but the, the landscape, which is, you know, this version versus, you know, a portrait shot, kind of showed a little more of the trees on the side, right? I kind of wanted the shot to kind of fall off. And the, the simple way to put it is, what do you see in terms of composition, right? I see a walkway, right? And, and to me, that my eyes go to this area of the picture and makes me want to take a walk down there. Now, within this, within this shot, you have, um, you have these, uh, the, the trees, I'm sorry, the palm trees. So if you look at the palm trees, they weren't originally like this. The lighting was coming through, but through Lightroom, and I'll bring it up, you can, and I don't have this specific shot right now, but I can show you, and this is getting a little in depth, a little too quick, but this one's not edited. This picture, this is of the sequoias, but, and it's actually not quite exposed as I want, but you can go in with a clarity tool, whoops, we'll go, we don't want that. So we'll go here, clarity, whoop. And as you can see, oh, PayPal. You can dial in some, oh my gosh. You can dial in some clarity here. That really pops the details. Now this is not exposed. This picture is just not exposed how I want it. But you know I can bring this down. You can see the difference. Whoop, 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 whoop. So there, there are many different free options. Um, a quick Google search is pretty easy. Um, a quick Google search. Uh, oh my God! A quick Google search is pretty easy. I haven't ever, honestly, I haven't, haven't ever used any. I know there's lots of options. I just prefer Lightroom because it has a lot of uh, it does have advanced 
options, but it's very easy to use. Everything's cataloged. Yeah, and honestly, it's not even that much, Hunky Dory. You know, you're looking at 10 bucks a month for Lightroom and Photoshop. It gets automatically uh, updated, which is great. All right, so you saw with what I just did with that sequoia tree, I can come in here and I can paint all this stuff. Now, to go even further, we could pop into Photoshop, but this is not what this class is about. I honestly tend to use Lightroom for probably 95%. 90, no, Lightroom is not $60 a month. If you, there's a package for Lightroom for photographers. It's Lightroom and Photoshop and it's 10 bucks. Um, it's, it's, for the price, it's unbelievable. But what I was gonna say was, I use Lightroom 95% of the time. Uh, most of the time, I don't want to change the scene any more than what it is, other than popping some clarity here and there, or, you know, saturation, hues, and I'll get into that a little bit. But let's go into here. I'm gonna go into my little sheet that I made earlier today about nature photography since we're kind of we're about 10 minutes in and hopefully people are starting to pile in I think we got about 10 million yeah we got about 10 million people watching right now which is great so the so basically with photography the three things you really need to understand and I hope you can read along with me here is your ISO your shutter and your aperture those are the three main components to when you're going out and you're taking photos and this you know, you might want to, you might say, well, you know, it's easy for me to go out with my camera that was 500 bucks and just, you know, put it on auto. And that's fine and you can do that. But if you want to take your photos to the next level, right, to look a little better, these three pillars are very key to understand and to know. So you got ISO, which is your, I'm just going to read it, your exposure tool that changes the camera's sensitivity to light. Now this is not like in Lightroom bringing up the exposure. This is completely different. The biggest thing with ISO is you, the rule of thumb is you want to keep it as low as possible. The higher you go with ISO, the more noise you'll get. And in a camera like I'm using right now, a Sony a7 III, which goes about two grand right now, great bang, bang for your buck. You can get away with a little higher ISO, right? You can get, you know, I've taken shots 3,200 and with, you know, Lightroom or Photoshop or another free service that you can get online, uh, you can find some really powerful noise reduction tools. But the cheaper the camera, the more noise you're going to get. That's just, that's just how it is. So the rule of thumb, even with the higher-end cameras, is you want to bring your ISO as low as you can within the shot. Uh, there's a relationship between ISO and shutter, and that's where you want to use your shutter speed to balance out, as you can see, balance out the exposure if your ISO is too high. And I'll get into shutter speed right now. Exposure, uh, shutter is your exposure tool to freeze or blue, blur a moving subject. So let's say you're out at a marsh and it's, uh, you know, maybe the, the wind's blowing, the, the clouds are moving pretty, pretty quick. So you can use a low shutter speed and those clouds will then become kind of wispy. Same thing with water, like a river running, right? It'll look like it's kind of a, uh, like a mist on top waterfalls you could do this come it's a very really neat effect problem with that is the lower your shutter speed the more shake camera shake or handshake that you can get so and by that i mean you're holding the camera the shutter speed that means the shutter is open longer right so any movement the camera will it'll affect the shot because the camera moves so that's why if you go lower you should to a certain, there's a certain level I found, it's about, I mean, I've handheld up to like, down to like 50, 1 50th of a shutter. I would not normally recommend that. I would say like 150 to 200 is, is safe, but anything lower, I would definitely recommend a monopod or a tripod. 
On the flip side, higher shutter will freeze things. So let's say you're taking a shot of a bird flying, right? Well, you don't want that bird to be blurry, right? So you're gonna have to increase your shutter speed to capture that, to stop, to freeze that bird in midair. Now there's no, there's no rhyme or reason, there's no exact number to that. That's something that you're gonna have to dial in on location because it all depends on the light available and I'll go into that in a second. But that's where that shutter speed comes in. Uh, the other one is aperture. Aperture is the exposure tool that changes your depth of field. Depth of field is how in focus things are. So you can see right now this camera, so let me go back here. It's measured in f-stops, okay? The lower the f-stop, which we call faster, would bring in more light and you would lose depth of field. So the background would be blurry. A higher f-stop, which we call slower, would be less light getting in, which creates more depth of field. My number one thing, and I'm in this whole class, I want to tell you guys, you want to master manual mode, okay? Yes, you can go into aperture mode and set your aperture, and you can have the camera automatically set your ISO and your shutter speed, but that to hone that in, you got to go in your menus, you got to set different things so your camera doesn't go all wacky on you. And yeah, you might have nailed that four stop to get that depth of field that you wanted, but your ISO, because of how the light was, was way too high or way too low, or your shutter speed was way too slow, and you didn't know that at the time, and then it was blurry. So do you understand what I'm saying? So that's why you wanna, you wanna master these three. So my advice, and I'm gonna skip my, this one part really quick, is my first three steps, right, when I go out. Number one thing, is you wanna know what kind of depth of field you want in the shot. And now this can change between photos, right? But you wanna have an idea at first. What is your depth of field? So let's say you're doing a landscape and you want the most depth of field that you can get in the shot, okay? Like, uh, let me pull up a shot here from Costa Rica so I can show you what I'm talking about, right? Okay, so... Da, 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 da. So this shot right here, okay? I wanted, I wanted a lot of depth of field because I wanted to get this most of this scene in focus as best as I could, okay? Now, I think it, this shot might have been an F11, which really cut down the light, okay? But you can see how much of this picture is in focus, right? Now, this isn't in focus, but it's because my focal, I mean, the, the, the focal plane is so far away that it would almost be impossible to get all that in crisp focus. But you can see what I'm saying, right? So in this situation, I knew that I wanted to get that depth. So I raised my ISO higher to get that. Now, there's no rule. Like, you can go to 9, you can go to 5, 6, you can go to 22. I would never, normally never go that high. But there's no rule. It's just like what, it's trial and error and it's what you think works. And sometimes, you know, a mistake could be the better photo. You never know until you do it. So that's a perfect example of that. So you find, let's go back to tips. So you find that aperture that you want. Once you find that aperture, you set your shutter speed to your desired effect. Do you want, you want it slower? You want wispy clouds? Do you want smooth water? Well, just remember, if you want to do that, you need to have a stabilization for that camera, okay? We've already covered that. Or do you want do you want a faster shutter, which is probably normally what you would do, okay? I would say anywhere from 400 to 640 is a really good handheld shutter speed. Um, it's what I found avoids camera shake. You know, maybe you know, some people shake with their hands or you might accidentally move just a little bit and you don't want any blur in your shot. So I would say 400 to 600, I'm sorry, 640 is a good way to do it. Now you can go lower if you feel comfortable, but that's just trial and error. So once you have those two set, 
you will adjust your ISO as low as possible. And within that, you'll use your shutter speed to help the balance. Now, when you're outside, not under a canopy of trees in the rainforest, you know, there's a lot of light. So you're, you're able to have a higher shutter speed most of the time and keep your ISO low. I know that we had, really quick, excuse me. I know we had somebody that really likes bird photography and this can be a really great hobby, but it can be really hard depending on where you're at and the lighting because you, for example, you want to freeze that bird right? Flying. Well, you have to raise your ISO. Well, what happens, you know, a lot of times the, the best time to bird is, you know, in the morning or toward the evening. So now you're not at midday where you have all this light. So now you have to find the relationship between how high can you push your shutter to keep your, I'm sorry, your ISO to keep your shutter where you want it. And you see this a lot with sports photographers inside. Hunky Dory, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's what I'm trying to say. So that's where a really good lens comes into play. Um, and so for example, if you're, if you're doing a bird, let's say a perfect example would be you're birding in the rainforest, okay? And there's a toucan and the rainforest, even in midday can be dark, okay? And you're handhelding, you, don't, you didn't bring a tripod, right? And it's, you know, you're at 640 and your ISO is already at 2000. You're like, oh man, you know, my aperture, my lens can only go to a 5.6. Well, now you're a little bit in trouble here, right? You don't quite have the tools needed to really get that shot like a pro. And I'm not expecting anybody a pro. I mean, even I'm not a pro when it comes to that kind of shooting animals. But that's where a fast lens you know, so part of this PDF file that I have is one of the most important purchases you can make is lens or lenses within the focal range that you want, okay? And that's, you know, a lens that can go down to like a two, for, for this kind of stuff, like a 2.8 is nice to have. Now, honestly, you're not going to do really any landscapes with a 2.8 lens because the focal plane, you would it would be so much out of focus. Um, but in those situations, if you need that shot, like birding, that's you're gonna need it. If you don't have that option, you just make the best out of it, right? If you if you have to raise your ISO, you just find that happy medium where you're happy with it. And look, nobody's pixel peeping. You know, I, I don't believe in that to a certain extent. You know, if you have a shot and it's got some noise in it. You put it in post, and I'll show you exactly what that can do. Just, you know, just do what you can. So keeping your ISO, ISO low, and the biggest thing is, although aperture is a exposure tool, do not touch your aperture at all, because that will then affect your depth of field, right? Now, again, once you, be, once you get used to this, you might be at like an F4 and things are, you know, you're just a little off. You don't want to go, you know, you want to come down a little bit with your ISO, but you don't want to move your shutter. You could probably get away with bringing it down a stop, opening it up a little bit and not really losing too much of, or closing it and losing too much of what you want. You just don't want to, you just don't want to sit, move your aperture around like you, you move your shutter around. Uh, that's a disaster waiting to happen. So those three things. Keep your aperture the same. Find your shutter speed and ISO relationship to what kind of shot that you want. Uh, so then my basic manual setup when I'm taking photos, right? I have one of my lenses uh, uh, has, I think it goes down to 2.8, but my walk around stuff is usually a, a four stop. That gives me some wiggle room on focal length. Um, 2.8 is really good, but sometimes it can be hard to nail that. Let's say you're, let's say you're doing, um, this isn't nature photography, but let's say you're walking around at a birthday party, right? Or around, around Canton, right? And you're just getting shots of things. Uh, a 2.8 can be really, really great at really dialing in those eyes on somebody or really dialing on detail, but it, there is that sharp focal plane, and if you miss it, 
it, you miss it and you zoom in and you're like, oh my gosh, it's not in focus. Look, I've done it many times. So that's where if you bring it back to like an F4, you have a little more wiggle room on the autofocus to hit your spot. Um, shutter speed, walking around, if you don't have a uh, tripod, 400 to 640 is what I suggest. Again, you can come down from that if you feel comfortable with your posture and holding the camera, but just know that the lower, the more camera shape you can get. And again, you can tweak these settings all you want as you go, except just make sure the aperture is where you want it. So again, you know, my final note on this, understanding the three pillars, mastering light contrast and finding compositions and perspectives that complement the scene is the ultimate goal. And I can tell you this right now, it's one of the hardest things to do is to understand light in the camera. And I, it seems so simple when you just say it out loud, but light is so powerful, shadows are so strong, and it can bring so much texture, but it's about knowing how to do it, right? So my perfect example would be uh, let me see if I have one in here. Da, 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 da. Maybe in Lightroom. Let me get out of this. So a perfect example would be a shot like this. And I'll pull it up. And it didn't work. And I'm going to go over why this didn't work. But you can see, right? So this was at Sequoia National Park. Okay? And if I were to expose, and this is about knowing light. And, and learning how to take these pictures. If I were to expose for those sequoia trees, the entire backdrop would be completely blown out. It would be super, like I can just show you right now. Look, if I bring up the shadows, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna bring up the shadows. I was in my real estate. You know, you bring up, so if I'm exposing, so let's say this is the shot of exposing for it, right? For the trees look how blown out that's not a good picture that's awful right so in this situation what are your options well you can do what I did and you can bracket your photos and this is advanced and this could be another class actually I'm sorry I didn't even Oh, I did bracket I did a three bracket you could bracket your photos and then in post you merge them together for an HDR but at the end of the day I would tell you like in this situation, this shot just doesn't work. And that, that was one thing I was going to talk about was it can get frustrating when you're not a Nat Geo photographer and you don't have the time to go out and look at the weather and look at the sun and, and know where you need to be at the exact time. No, most people don't have time for that, right? Like when I went to Sequoia, you know, we packed up the kids, we went there, and I had no say on where the situation, like when we went, I, I couldn't affect, I couldn't control the weather. I couldn't control the light, right? So my biggest advice to people that are looking for good shots are even if you have something, like I had a shot in mind here, like, oh my gosh, these two giant sequoias look great together. But when you look at it for real, it's like, well, it just doesn't work because of where the sun's at. So what did I do? I took the shot. I just wanted to see what it did in post when I bracketed them. But at the end of the day, you just move on. You just, you just have to find another shot, right? So this is not bad, right? It's a silhouette shot, but and with how these trees are and everything, it just doesn't work. But with that said, you're on, you're on a digital device. You're not on film, so it's not costing you money to take the photo. So take the photo and then trash it later if you don't like it. But you can see here, you just move on, right? So I just moved on, found where the light was peeking through, and this is not edited at all. This is uh, just to show you different perspectives, trying to find shots when the shots that I wanted were not there, okay? So there's an example of that. Let's go back to the PVDF. Is there any questions? Anybody have any questions on what we're talking about? I hope, I hope I'm not talking too much.
So going back to the PDF and, and talking about the three tools, um, you need to understand, again, to emphasize, you need to understand how they relate to each other, okay? Understanding light and contrast and not shooting a subject into a bright sky, right? And then just like, oh, we'll just, we'll, fo you know, if you're, if you're taking a picture of a family member or a, a tree, a beautiful tree, right? And you expose for that tree and the sun's behind it, it's just going to be blown out white sky and it's not going to look natural. Now, that could be what you wanted and it's art and for the most part, you know, there might be people out there that like that. Me personally, I'm more of a natural shooter and I want to see what my eyes are seeing at the time. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that shot. Maybe it's a silhouette at that point, right? So maybe it's a tree where you can expose for the sky and the, and the tree in front is a silhouette. It's dark, right? Because that's, that's what the camera sees. So just, you know, and it's about looking and, and seeing if it looks good. I mean, that's another thing I tell people all the time is, do you, when you, when you take the picture and you look at it, does it look good? And I can tell you nine times out of a 10, if you're true to yourself, you'll know that answer. Now, that doesn't mean it was bad that you took the shot. Like I said, it's, it's digital, so it doesn't cost anything. Um, other thing is there's no rules. The, the pillars are there to help expose your shot and get your effect, whether depth of field or whatnot. So again, best advice, go out, start shooting, get comfortable with the settings. Um, and again, use your advantage that it's not film and it doesn't cost anything. And again, find scenes that tell a story and compose. It's one of the easiest things to do and get lenses. All right, so we've kind of gone over that. Let's get in the Lightroom here. And let's go down to some more of the recent shots I've done. So I'm going to go into this shot here. So this is at Crosswinds Park. Uh, this is with a 16 to 35 millimeter lens. And, and that's another thing I'm going to tell you guys. Like I, not everybody can go out and afford all these, these expensive lenses, right? So I would say get what you think you can use. And the, with the money that you can afford, and I mean, look, you can you can get amazing stuff with anything, right? It, the the lenses are just tools at this point. Now, the more tools you have, the more you can do, and the easier it is on you, no doubt. This is just a 16 to 35 lens. I did this. I did two options on this shot, and I'll tell you, I like this one better. You'll see. I'm sorry. Let me get to here. So here's this version. And here's this version. So what is the difference in these shots? So the difference in these shots is my focal point is on the background back here, these trees, okay? When I was originally looking at this, I wanted kind of a window to the marsh kind of feeling. And although this is really a really nice shot, right, it just didn't draw me in as much as this shot did. And just a simple change here. What is my focal on this? My focal point on this. My focal point is the wood. And the reason why I did this is because I felt like even though this is beautiful, right? Hunky, I see your question. I'll get to it in one second. Even though this is really beautiful, this, for some reason, was really drawing me in, right? Kind of that broken wood, looks old and, and kind of rustic, right? So I focused on this and then you just do a little editing. And I'll show you a quick, and this is not an editing tutorial, but I'll show you what this looked like without any editing. That's without it, okay? So all I really did in this shot is I adjusted the, the white balance, I adjusted the clarity, the vibrance, and I probably brought up some, maybe some shadows and took down some highlights, but I'll go into that really quick. And then I also dialed in some of these, like I told you earlier, where you can take the brush tool and you can brush in clarity. And I'll show you right here. Let's go back. Okay. So here we are, right? Brought down some highlights in the sky. And again, this is really all I do with editing. I don't do too much with my shots. 
right? This is a little more dramatic than normal just because that's what I was feeling at the time when I edited it. But, you know, so I popped the clarity up. And you can see the difference with clarity. See how it really dials in some detail, okay? Vibrance and saturation to really get some of these yellows and highlight the greens in the trees. I don't think I messed with these and this one. And then here, I'll bring this up. These are my brush strokes, and I'll do this right here. So this is my clarity and my exposure. So you can see I dialed in a few spots. And if you look, I can turn this off. See the difference? Still a good shot, but see when I add that clarity, how it really pops that wood grain? Really makes a difference. Okay? And then down here is where your noise reduction is. My ISO, if you look right here, is at 100, right? So I don't have too much, I don't have any grain at 100. Four stop, because I wanted that fall off. That's right there. I wanted that blurry, because I wanted this more like the window, and I wanted this to have a little more of the focal point. So big difference in your... So this is a, F, a 5.6 because I wanted a little more in focus, right? Still 100. But you can see, too, things change every shot. This is a 16.35. This shot's at a 22 millimeter. This is at a 28, right? A little different composure, composition, similar shots. Let's go to your question, Al-Gidori. I had one instructor tell me that he uses flash fill a lot. Never think to do this. And I'm not sure how I like the effect thoughts. If you're talking about like animal photography, is that what you're talking about? I'm assuming. Because that is a valid strategy. That is a valid strategy, but it just brings an extra gear, right? I mean, if you're if you're a professional that's going out for a professional photo and you're in like the so yes, I would tell you this. If, if I were going to do professional shots in Costa Rica, in the rainforest, it definitely is a really good option. It is a good option because you can counter the lighting issues with that flash. Now, the trick is to make it look as natural as you can, right? And that takes practice. I personally don't like adding light artificial light to natural scenes, but I, I can see how for a someone that makes money for someone to get a shot of an animal in the rainforest using every tool possible to get that shot, I can understand it. For a normal person, I don't think it's worth it. I, I think the setup and what you need to do to hone that skill, I don't think it's worth it. I think that you just... Uh, do the best you can with what you have, honestly. I mean, I'll go into my Costa Rica stuff. I mean, hunky-dory, when I went to Costa Rica, I didn't have a flash fill, right? Um, let me go to this. There's my wife. So these monkeys, right? So this is natural. So yes, I could have brought in a artificial light and hit him right here, right? But this is what I'm going to tell you. Unless you're camping out and you know a good idea where that animal is going to be, it's all, I mean, it's so hard, right? So some of these are in the moment, you know, and, and there are some shots that took to get to this point, right? Some were over, overexposed, some were underexposed. But with today, with these cameras, you can get away with a lot, right? You can get away with in post bringing up the shadows or or bring as long as as long as one extreme isn't too far right like if the if the the whites and the highlights are blown out you can't you're not going to recover them just like if the blacks are so black right unless that's part of the scene to create texture and and feel and you leave those blacks alone if they're too those blacks are too far on the histogram, right? 
if you bring those up, you're going to get so much noise, it's going to look, it's going to look bad. It, even if with the best noise reduction, it's not going to be good. So in this shot, um, I don't have this version in Lightroom right now, but these are shadows brought up. I kind of, honestly, the, the, and I do this with my video shots, Hunky, is it's what I call split the difference, right? In the moment, put it in the middle, knowing that I'm going to have to, because it wasn't the most ideal lighting, right? I mean, you can see, you know, I have bright light behind him and he's in shade, right? So I kind of split the difference where I had room on each side where I could bring it into Lightroom or if any Photoshop or any free um, app and kind of bring those shadows up. I have some more of these animal ones I'll show you. Same thing here, right? So this is another perfect example. And, and Hunky, this is what I'm talking about in the moment feel. Yes, you could bring, and this is, I'm not saying that bringing a flash is a bad idea. You easily can do that if you want, right? It, it brings more complexity, more camera setup uh, and, and exposure tools that you have to counter. But look at this shot right here, right? So he's in, I waited for him, and he, he sat down in this little pocket of light. And yes, there's a lot of fall off here, but that's what I try to tell people. Don't be afraid of shadow, right? Expose it correctly, and it's okay to have some shadow in the shot. This is a natural looking shot. This is what it looked like. So here, same. this is the same exact tree, just a little bit different spot. Yeah, I brought up the shadows on him a little bit in post, and when I mean by bringing up the shadows, I'll show you what I'm talking about if anybody's doesn't know what I mean by that. So let's go to let's go to this shot. Right? So you can see I had a lot of bright behind me and this is a perfect example of I got to this Mayberry State Park a little too late in the day, right? So the sun was too far down, the clouds started rolling in. I wasn't getting any rays of light like I wanted. But it's not it's not all bad. This is not even edited. When I talk about bringing shadows up, with today's cameras, you can, when you shoot in RAW, which I highly recommend, if you want to be a serious photographer, I mean, just look what you can do here. So this is without them, right? And you can bring these shadows up, and I mean, there's no, I mean, here, there's shadows all the way up. There, I mean, there's some noise, but there's barely any noise, and this is at 640 ISO. No noise whatsoever right? And this is what I'm talking about, making do with what you have in the moment. And it's okay. You know, this is another example. Same shot, but edited, right? You can see how powerful editing can be. And remember I told you I don't like manipulating, but sometimes being a little creative with it, like a painting, can be really good. So this is pretty easy right here. So this was just Brought the highlights down in the, in the trees. Brought the shadows up. I dialed in some clarity. You can see my overlays here on the ground. Clarity there. I brought the temperature up because I wanted a little bit more orange. I desaturated. This is another key thing when you're doing editing. I desaturated the greens. You can see this is with the greens. Desaturated the greens to kind of give it, I thought it was like a gloomy effect. Um, but yeah, like, so what I'm saying is there's lots you can do within, with these cameras to make do when you don't have the lighting. Like here's another shot. Like I'm on vacation. And this is what this class is for, right? I'm not... You know, it's for people like me and you that go out and may not have all the tools at the time sometimes, but can take good shots, right? So this guy was hanging here. Obviously, it's white sky behind him. But instead of shooting from this direction, he's all in the white, right? I'm shooting into the light, which makes everything blown out. I moved to incorporate a lot of these leaves to help the contrast of the scene gives it texture, right? Gives it a sense of place. And then I brought up shadows on him. 
No, here's a great shot. Here's another example of composition. Okay, this, I wanted to show this tree with this shadow on the ground and the mountains in the distance. There's a lot of different ways you could take a shot like this, right? Here's some other direction. But see how your perspective and your composition and your focal length, all these can change the feeling of the photo, right? I mean, look at this. It's completely different. Completely different. Same location, different. Pretty incredible. And these are all just Costa Rica just because I found that these were good landscapes. Village Arts Factory, how do you feel about point and shoot versus camera? Well, versus camera phone. Oh, I mean, that's a tough one because I feel like the camera phones have come a long way and so have the point and shoot cameras. I would probably tell you that the camera, I would probably say the camera phone is better but you have a little more control with the point and shoot, if that makes any sense. You know what I mean? So I guess it just, at that point, it just depends on what kind of picture do you want in the moment. And if you're taking photos like that with your phone or with a point and shoot, you're not looking for these types of shots, right? It's not going to be exactly like this. There's going to be a, a you got to understand that there's a difference between those and a $2,000 to $6,000 camera with a nice lens, right? Um, like this shot right here I have up. Now you ain't getting that with that depth of field with a point and shoot or a cell phone. I mean, you could get it Technically, you could get something similar to that with the iPhone portrait mode, but nothing, nothing like that. I would probably say I would, I would probably go with the phone over the point and shoot at this point. Um, but again, the, the buy-in for a low-end camera, especially the Sony mirrorlesses um, and the Canons, are, are pretty affordable if you're, if you're interested in stepping up a little bit and having these options that I'm talking about. And this hour is really flying by because there's so much more I wanted to talk about. And this is another, and I'm going to go over here, and Hunky, I hope you can appreciate this, another example of being in a location, having literally no control of when you're there, the weather, or anything, and just kind of making the most of it. So we were driving by the Arano Volcano, and at the time it was just completely covered with here, this was the wide shot, right? Looks great, but it was so cloudy, so cloudy. But I stayed with it. I waited, thanks to my wife, right? So here's another version, a little, a little tighter. But see how the, it can change, just waiting a little bit, right? You know, understanding that not everything's going to be perfect sometimes and just kind of waiting it out. Sometimes you'll get that magical shot, and I love this shot, right? So you can see the hill here. This is why I exposed it, because I wanted to get this nice hillside with the green against the volcano. Hunky, another shot of a bird. Look, I, I had 100 to 400 lens, no flash fill. This is just me splitting the difference on the scene, right? Exposing so my highlights aren't blown out, but it's not too dark. And then in post, I can come in and I can bring up the shadows, bring down the highlights a little bit, and voila, there it is. Another example of composing, right? So this was the whale's tail in Costa Rica where the waves come over when the tide comes. And this whole area becomes flooded with water, right? So I really, really, really wanted a shot of those waves coming up, right? Just about to peak. I'm thinking, wow, this is going to be, I, I, I don't know if you can tell, I love like alleyways, right? Where your eye kind of goes and, and kind of takes you for a virtual walk in your mind, right? But the shot didn't quite exist in my mind. There's my wife, hey. 
but it didn't, didn't exist, right? It just didn't do what I want. Now, that doesn't say that I didn't capture something beautiful, right? Look at this, you know, the, the, the wet sand and the reflection of the sky. It looks beautiful. The water is coming together like this. Wasn't, so another example. This is closer to what I wanted, right? Where you can see the sand on both ends, but the water converging. Not quite what I wanted at the time, but it was as close as I could get. You know, another shot, right? I had to split the difference here, make it so the sky wasn't too blown out, but I had enough I had enough in the shadows where I could bring them bring out a little bit, but you can see I didn't do too much here, right? Like look at this area right here, right? I I didn't I let that be what it was, and that's fine. It's fine to have it like that. Like that's a great picture for what it is, right? Yeah, I mean a flash fill could have filled him in, but to me that doesn't look natural. Now for someone that. Maybe they're documenting an animal for Nat Geo. I can see that being really helpful having. But that's an extra level. Um, let's go back to Lightroom. Another shot I wanted to tell you is like in the moment shots, right? You know, knowing, having a creative eye. And, and I think it comes natural to a lot of people it is something that you can learn to a certain extent. But the biggest thing is just you have to just take photos. You have to take photos. And this is a perfect example. This shot, this is, these are flowers at my mom and dad's house. And it was, we were getting ready to leave. And the sun was coming through the sky. And I saw this beautiful purple flowers getting just sprayed a little bit with light. And it just depended on how, it just was depending on how the wind blew. I had my camera. I got it out. And I'll try to show you the first couple. Let me find my mouse. Oh, too far. Sorry. Where am I at here? My mouse is going on my other screen on accident. I'm sorry. Okay, so here we go. So you can see how the light comes in, right? And that's kind of what I saw. The first shot I didn't know if I really liked. Okay. Settled on this one, did some editing, brought up the clarity. So this is without it, right? But you can see the difference in exposure. So this is 100, four stop, 250. And you can see between the two shots, because of the change in light, I went from... So, okay, that's what happened. I remember now. I took this shot, and it's great, but I wanted a little more depth of field. I wanted a little more depth of field. So this is a 2.8, this is a 4. So see how those flowers are a little more in focus, giving it a little more texture. And I hope you guys understand what I mean by texture. It's the best way I can describe it, a little more texture. Um, now within this, remember what I told you, like sometimes you have to change your settings. So my ISO never changes here. It's always 100, I'm 2.8. But this time, instead of a 320 shutter, I went to 250 to compensate a little less light on the flowers, right? So now let's go back to the edit. After I go, I went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There it is, okay. Nope. I oh, know that's not that other one. This was that other one. I'm sorry, but it's the same. It's the same shot. It's just I moved up a little bit to get a little more of that green. But anyways, you can. So to your point about the saturation. So I do have a filter on this a little bit where I dialed in some purple on my curve. Um, but yeah, just bringing in some of those purples are really good. I also want to show you another one of these shots I got the other day before we run out of time. Is there any other questions? I don't know if I've answered any or I've helped anybody in this other than me rambling. Oh, here's another example. So remember when I told you guys about how I went to Mayberry a little late and I was a little disappointed, right? And although these shots were nice, I thought this was cool, a hugging tree, 
it didn't quite do what I wanted to at the end when I post when I did it. But then as we're walking, you keep looking. You don't just stop. There's even when even when the situation isn't exactly what you want, you find things that can inspire, that can make you smile. And again, this didn't work for me. At the time I thought it looked cool, took the picture, found this one. Okay, now look at this shot. So this is the original. This is the edited. And I know you're going to say, well, Chad, you do a lot of editing. I, yes and no. I don't do that much editing. Most of my, and again, this is a great shot even without any editing whatsoever, in my opinion. But you pop it in the Lightroom or any free app. And, you know, I brought out the blues here and your saturation on your curve, your HSL, your hue saturating luminous, right? I brought down some of the blues. I kind of dialed in the greens a little bit and the yellow so it didn't overpower the blue. I also brought the blue down because the sun was hitting the flowers, so I didn't, it was a little more washed out than I wanted. And then from there, vibrance, clarity, and brought up the shadows a little bit. That's really all. There's really not, yeah, and again, hunky, raw, I mean, in, in, in my opinion, if you have a camera that can shoot raw and you're serious about taking good photos, you should be shooting in raw. Um, especially if you have no control over anything and you're just out because that'll give you the best opportunity to help that shot, if that makes any sense. And I think you know what I'm talking about because if you don't shoot raw... You don't. You can't do all this stuff. You can't. You can do some things, but you do not have this much control at all. No, that's not to say you can't shoot JPEGs. There's nothing wrong with that. In some scenes, that might be all you need, right? Like this shot here. Not this shot. That wasn't the shot I was looking for. What was it at? You can see though when I'm editing, I'm not in Photoshop. I'm not doing much other than here and there adjustments. I mean, every once in a while, I don't know if I did a gradient here. Yeah, I did a gradient to bring up the contrast and the clarity to the water, and you can see the difference. Just a little bit of a pop. See, a little bit of the pop in the water. And again, this is not hard. This editing is not hard. It's really easy to learn. It's not hard to do at all. I was trying to find a shot where it was minimal editing. The last few shoots I've been on have been tough because I have, oh, so this is, this is one right here. I put a couple dramatic effects on it um, just to get some little more purple, but there's not much editing done here. This could have been, this could have been done for a, with a JPEG, but it also, when you shoot raw, look what I can do. Look at these. Look at look what I just did. You can't do that. Look at that. Barely any noise. You can't do that with JPEGs. Now, I didn't want all that green. I wanted a little more silhouette, so we're going to take it back. Right? I just wanted to show that morning with mom and dad on the water. So I guess I'm almost done. I don't know if I... It went by too fast. Are there any other questions? Are there any, is there anything else I, I missed? Is there anything I missed that people would want to know? I mean, my biggest advice is to go into a shot, go into a shoot with a story in mind. You know, if you, if you have that mindset, there's no limit to what you can find. Right, and even even when the situation is not the greatest in lighting or weather, as long as you have that mindset of telling a story with one frame, where somebody can um, look at your photo and think of a memory or get a good feeling or make them think, maybe it makes them uncomfortable, depending on what it is. You know, um, that's my biggest advice. Three pillars, 
shoot, 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 and just create. Uh, yeah, Schwartzy Photos in the Village Arts Factory uh, gallery slash studio. You'll see some of my pictures up on the wall where you can come in to purchase the photos. Um, also a studio here where we can do portraits and um, modeling and headshots. Um, it's all available. So appreciate you guys coming and uh, I hope you had a good time. And I hope I can do it again because honestly, there's, it was too much to cover in an hour and it's partially my fault because I rambled too much. So I think that's it. I think I'm done. So please go to, go to Village Arts Factory's link and please donate. Help the arts. Um, arts and culture is so important to who we are as humans and we need it more than ever. So thanks everybody. Hope you had a good time. I had a blast. I could do this for hours and hours. Uh, Till next time, we will uh, we will do this again. I promise you. Thanks again.